All right. Well, first off, I want to say hello, everyone. Welcome to this month's Mother of All Demo Days meeting. In this iteration, we are thrilled to welcome folks joining us from our PL network companies alongside Endra's teams to share their latest progress and groundbreaking projects during this demo session. Um, so just a quick run through of who we have presenting today. We'll have Fixture Plate from Bedrock Tornado Teams, a short demo from Memix Garden with Oliver, creating confidential smart contracts with FHE and FHEVM with Zama. Daghouse will be presenting exploring content claims with GraphQL and learn more about building web apps on IPFS with Fireproof Storage. Starting with that, first off, we have Rod Bag presenting on behalf of the Bedrock Tornado Teams which is picture plate explaining and generating IPLT uh, DAGs. Hello, I want to introduce a little project that uh, was released today called Go Fixture Plate. It's in the IPLD org on GitHub. It's a tool that uh, came out of some work we were doing on retrievals, trying to get test fixtures for um, Unix FS pathing and just DAG pathing in general for cars and downloads, all that sort of stuff. Um, we needed fixtures, but we also needed assurance on um, that we were making sure we got the right blocks that we wanted out of a DAG for all the different forms of queries we were making. So I'm going to quickly show you how this works as a CLI. You can download the binary called fixture plate from um, GitHub or you can go install it. Um, so I'm, I've got a CID here that I'm going to fetch with Lassie. I'm going to fetch that off wherever it's coming from. Um, and I know this CID um, can, uh, points to a DAG that is a single file um, that's that takes up many blocks. So I'm going to now use fixture plate to explain that car for me and see what's in it, why it needed to have so many blocks. So here I can see my my single file is sharded across many uh, leaf blocks and you can see which bytes take up which blocks. Um, so this explains why that one CID resulted in all these blocks. You can do more interesting things like uh, I'll get the Wikipedia CID. So Lassie fetch Wikipedia, I'm going to select, select the, fetch the cat page from Wikipedia. So that contains a bunch of blocks too. So why did one page need so many blocks? Fixture plate, explain uh, that file. And I'm going to, I'm going to also uh, say ignore missing because there's a lot of missing blocks here because it's not all of Wikipedia. So now I can see that this, this one file cat was sharded across two different blocks and it was part of a sharded directory. The wiki directory is really large, so it gets sharded at multiple levels, and this shows you how it navigates through that. So the CID re I requested relates to the page that I got um, through all of these steps, and this is how we make a trustless car, and this explains how we navigate through the DAG to get the blocks we want. Now we can do more interesting things with fixture plate. Uh, we can generate some uh, some synthetic DAGs for use in testing. So, I, and it's got a little DSL on the command line. I'm going to generate a directory that's got 10 files that are approximately 1k each, well, that are 1k each. Um, and it's going to tell me what it's doing, give me a car, uh, I can explain that car, and it'll show me what it did, it made this, this directory for me. Now, it can get uh, much more interesting than that. So, I can say, um, let's say one file with one meg, but I want to make a subdirectory that is sharded. Uh, this is where it gets really interesting. And each that subdirectory is going to take have 20 or approximately let's take approximately 20 files of approximately 10 bytes each. Um, so let's make that. I'm going to explain that. Uh, I'm going to dash dash car. Explain that whole DAG. So this is the whole DAG that we made. This is the kind of thing you would see, maybe not with these names, but this is a, uh, a random um, DAG that I might use for testing purposes. Now, how would I use it for testing? Well, let's say I want to get this file here, which is inside of a sharded directory. So I'm going to, um, I'm going to explain that car again, and I'm path it into that file, and it will show me which blocks uh, would be needed for a trustless query from the root all the way down to that file. And I can even do things like byte ranges. So if I get this one meg file and I want bytes, let's say this block, we'll get this block to the end 
So this is the kind of query you would do. So this, I've now just got the certain byte range of that file. But if I did this query, if I pass that query onto the IPFS trustless gateway, um, I would download a car and I should get back a car with these four blocks in it um, just for that, the, that entity bytes query there would get that. So this is useful for that kind of testing. Um, so now this is useful for um, in our retrieval tools for testing. We've got it built into some of our um, integration tests. Um, but I, I think it's actually a really good tool for understanding DAGs, particularly as we start talking about trustless cars. You can use this to actually explain to you what on earth is inside the car and why you should trust it. And that's it. Up next, we have Memex with Oliver. So this may be a bit outside of the engineering domain like um hard hard engineering it's uh probably more of an uh kind of an adjacent or supportive tool for your work in particular for workflows where you need to um read and research websites papers github logs or whatever um that you need to either do by yourself or with other people and where things become really tricky doing that um so maybe some of you already have been running into these issues where, for example, you had uh, you wanted to save something, you need to copy paste links around, you need to copy paste text sections around, you have all these graveyards of documents all over the place uh, with the information that was really important. And uh, it becomes messy, messier and messier in particular uh, if you have to collaborate with other people. So it's already a problem if you're by yourself, but it's going to get exponentially worse if you have to do any sort of like reading together, papers, websites, etc. And so we built Memex to make that a bit easier. And um, yeah, I'm just going to start with the more personal organization parts. So how do you keep track of the things you read online? And the, re and the next section will be um, how do you do that collaboratively? So yeah, the, the most basic thing you need to do here with Memex is that if you want to save an article, you just press on save. And from that point on, it's full text searchable. So that means you can find it even if you didn't put any organization on top. You can find it by all the words inside the article. So I'm just copy this word right now. And then you just press M space into the address bar and you can search for dialogues. It finds all the articles with dialogues. You see the first one is uh, Aristotle, but you can also get to dashboard where you can see a full overview of all the articles you saved or apply more filters. For example, the time frame, the domain it was on, or maybe spaces you put in. And spaces are for us a bit like tags with a difference that you can also share them or collaboratively curate them. But yeah, you don't have to not organize. You can also do some organization with that. And soon also you're gonna have the ability to have nested spaces so you can create trees um, that are present um, your folder structures that you maybe have in your bookmarks or that you just wanna like organize things by project. The next thing that you can do with Memex is that you can also highlight and annotate. So if you wanna mark up a piece of text, you just make a highlight here. Uh, you can also mark up a piece of text and add a comment to it. Okay, this is important like this. Works also with papers. So if we're going to an archive paper, for example, uh, and also works by the way with papers that are also uh, stored local. So if you wanna annotate a locally annotated PDF, you just drag it into a browser and do the same thing I just did, open the reader uh, where you can start annotating in Memex. Like this. And then you just um, highlight a piece of text, same thing. And I'm actually right in this very moment and hopefully by tomorrow or latest on Monday, um, you're gonna also be able to drag rectangles that create screenshots and that also anchor. So you can add, also uh, annotate illustrations, et cetera, that are hard to capture in pure text. And the last content piece that you can annotate is YouTube videos. Oops, uh, there. Uh, there you can either create timestamp notes so you can create like sections, like times, uh, timestamps with sections of the video. Uh, if you click on those timestamps, it actually will jump back and forth in the video um, to the places you wanted to annotate. Uh, the second thing is you can do smart notes, which essentially summarizes for you the last X seconds of the video. So if you don't want to type it up, what's in the, what's in the video, you can just let it like AI do the thing for you. Um, you can also decide on how many seconds you want to include in that summary. And you can also summarize the entire video, by the way. Um, we have an AI assistant that allows you to basically say, hey, I wanna, for example, tell me the key takeaways of this video. And it will just go and uh, analyze the video and give you a summary. 
And you can prompt it however you want to, ultimately. Um, and the last bit is that you can also make screenshot based annotations. So you can say, I want to get a snapshot of the current frame, including a timestamp and make my note there because sometimes you want to capture, for example, yeah, maybe a, an important like graphic or so they used in the video, et cetera. Um, and uh, on the last piece of the personal organization stuff is that you, uh, since two days ago, uh, you also have now an Obsidian and Loxig integration that automatically syncs all the things you save and annotate into your graphs. Uh, so if you, if you use any of those, uh, we can just go. Um, how I learned to stop worrying about nuclear waste. You see here, it's automatically already there. It's actually like super snappy. So if I add a new note here, you'll see how fast it will be here. Oh, that's it. Like it's very fast. Luckily, because uh, well, Obsidian, Obsidian's great infrastructure and architecture uh, is so close like to the file system that this is just very fast. Um, and we just save our updates to the file system, which is in this case a big advantage, which also would be a big advantage actually to use something like that with IPFS powered tools because you just need to write to the disk and that's it. And we have a, a kind of a, a local backup helper that allows you to um, like really quickly save anything to local disk uh, with it. And it's gonna be also a bit of a jumping point later for uh, API connections that you want to do somewhere else, maybe in other apps that you want to integrate. We also, in that local backup helper, had um, a while ago a little a, a prototype for actually hooking uh, IPFS in natively. So if someone wants to revive this and um, make Memex more natively uh, working with IPFS, uh, just hit me up and we can chat about it. So yeah, these were the... oh. Damn it, you didn't actually see my, uh, I just realized you didn't see the uh, sync to uh, Obsidian because that part of the screen was not shared, bummer. But yeah, it's it's very snappy. It's basically uh, going there and but I wanna show it because it makes a lot of sense. So, so for example, if I add now a note here, this is always Obsidian. If I add a note here, you see how fast it's here. It's really quick, it's like instant essentially. And here are all the notes and the screenshots that I made already before. And those are also links to the YouTube video section. So you will always get back from that particular um, timestamp because it's all marked down. Yeah, interoperability, great. Um, yeah, so the last bit I wanna show is how do you collaborate? And this might be for people who have this workflow of needing to often share, for example, commentary on the things you read. Uh, maybe you wanna discuss a paper in depth with other people and you wanna have a quick way of doing that without needing to spam your chat logs or without copy pasting the content of the paper into a Google doc and starting there, which I heard a lot of people do. And so in order to uh, start annotating a page together, the only thing you need to do here is really pressing on share page. What that will do is create a link to that page with the annotations on that page that you add there. Uh, in this case, the in annotations that I already created before were private, so they're not automatically added there, but I can add them there. But all the annotations that I'm now adding while I'm in this, what we call focus mode, will automatically be added there. I'm just doing this right now quickly. And then if I take that link here, I can invite people to either have read access or have contribute access. And when they open this link, they will get to our web reader, which is a, um, a renderer for the annotations that they can uh, use, even if they don't use Memex. So this is the view that someone sees that does not use Memex as the extension. Um, they can see your highlights. They can even make their own highlights on top of it. Like this. See that? Um, add a comment, whatever. Um, and they don't need to install anything. You just send them a link. It's basically our design objective was making it as easy as working on a Google Doc when you want to collaborate with other people. That's the workflow for just one page. Um, if you want to, for example, share an entire research collection. So say, for example, yeah, you, you, have, you want to dive into some new machine learning technique and you want to collect a bunch of papers, a bunch of websites, a bunch of videos. Uh, you can do that by using the spaces I hinted at before. Let me find one, for example, here's one, um, where those can also be shared. You can open them in a web view, 
this is links that people can open even again if they don't use Memex. Um, they see all your links here, then see all the annotations here. If they click on those results, they get to that reader I showed before. And they can also summarize the article straight from here so they can get a kind of a skimmable overview of the things you put in without needing to read every single piece um, that you put in there. Yeah, um, that's it. That was Memex. If you want to um, get started with it, uh, check it out at memex.garden. So memex.garden. Like this, there you can download it. We're actually just about to start uh, like out of our closed beta. So this is really time timely uh, to present it today, but we already have to sign up and logins and downloads open already. So check it out, enjoy. Up next is Clement with Zama. Hi, um, today I'm presenting you uh, FHEVM. This is a project we are working on uh, at Zama. So Zama basically is a company working on um, homomorphic uh, encryption. So homomorphic encryption, to summarize it, is the possibility to compute over encrypted data. So FHEVM is one project uh, dedicated to integrate uh, homomorphic encryption and computation over encrypted data uh, directly in uh, an EVM. So uh, today I'll uh, show you uh, an example, like a classic ERC-20 contract. Um, so basically to use uh, uh, what we, we've done, basically you need to import like a, a library available on NPM. Uh, the, the idea around the FHEVM is uh, that we uh, added some pre-compiled uh, contract to compute over uh, encrypted data. So if you take a look at uh, our contract, we have like the total supply, which is not uh, like a classic uint 256, but uh, non-encrypted uh, uint 32. And it's the same for the balances because uh, the idea is that all balances of every user are encrypted, but still, if it's encrypted, we can uh, still uh, do transfer, mint, and et cetera. So this is like a classic RC20, like the few differences we'll see is basically like the the way we mint, for example. So if you mint uh, an amount of token, the user will send uh, an encrypted amount. So this is an amount encrypted with a FHE key. We need to validate uh, this amount. So to validate this amount, we'll check the zero knowledge proof that it's a valid ciphertext. And then when we validated the amount, we get like an encrypted uh, uint and we can add it directly to the balance of the contract owner and also, of course, to the total supply. If we take a look at the transfer method, uh, and you'll see that it's really similar of what you would do for a normal contract. So if you want to transfer uh, some token, uh, you, will, you will send an encrypted amount uh, to someone so first you need to check that the user has enough token to transfer. So this is like a require, but at this point, you need, you need to do uh, some decryption because if you want to check uh, the amount uh, regarding the balances of the sender, you will get an encrypted Boolean. So this is encrypted. You don't know if the user has uh, enough token. So you need to do a decryption. So at this point, we will do one decryption. So if we decrypt something, we are leaking some information, but the only information we are leaking is uh, this user has uh, this encrypted amount on this encrypted balance. So basically we don't link much information, but in other case, it would be, a, it may, it could be a problem. So this is the require. And then you see the balance is like what you, you've done uh, like what you would done with a, a classic transfer. So you're just adding and um, removing amount from the, the balances. <clears throat> um, the, we, we can do that because we are using the Solidity uh, 0819, which uh, allow uh, operator overloading. Uh, behind the scene, uh, this sign is uh, interpreted with a pre-compiled function doing uh, homomorphic uh, computation. So uh, this is like, it's it looks like classic computation, but uh, it's really like a homomorphic encryption uh, behind the scene. So we can test it. So this is like a classic remix instance because we don't change the compiler. Like it's a classic Solidity compiler. So you can compile your contract. There is nothing uh, new because like when you are using TFHE library, 
basically we just call pre-compile. So the only need is you need to deploy it on an EVM with this pre-compile. So you need to deploy this on a FHEVM basically. So <clears throat> we'll switch to a MetaMask account, which is connected to our DevNet with FHEVM. And we can deploy our contract. So when the contract is deployed, the first thing we want to do is to mint uh, the contract. So we we are using a specific version of uh, Remix. Basically, it's exactly the same as Remix, but we have did like a, a small tool to encrypt uh, data uh, on the fly. So for for example, I want to encrypt uh, one thousand uh, token. So I will just tip one thousand, but in fact it will uh, create the ciphertext uh, with the proof uh, in Remix directly. So I can make a transaction. So I asked to, uh, I sent to the EVM, basically I want to, to mint an encrypted amount. So no one knows how many token I, uh, I asked uh, to, to encrypt. And if you look at the, the transaction hash, so this is my mint transaction. And as you can see, like uh, the input is fully encrypted. Like there is no one thousand appear appearing anywhere. And um, so next step is to check the balance of the owner. So uh, if you want to check the balance of your owner, you want to be sure that you are exposing the balance of someone, uh, because like if you are doing a, a call, this is not uh, authenticated. Like you can ask any balance and pretend to be anyone. So to, to do that, we are using uh, EIP 712 token. So the idea is uh, when, uh, as a user, you want to, to allow a DAP to access some information, you will sign a public key and you will send this public key to the function. And then we have a, a method called reencrypt. You will send the ciphertext and the public key, and we will do a reencryption because the, the whole EVM using the same FHG key. So you will do a reencryption with the user key. So to be sure that it's a valid user key, you, the user need to sign it. So for example, I will use the balance of, so we added a public key a signing. So I the DAP asked me to sign the public key. I allow the signature. So now I can call with my public key and the signature of the public key. So the contract knows that I'm really the message sender and it allows me to uh, re-encrypt my balance. So it would be the same for the transfer. So if I want to transfer some token to a second account, basically it would be the same, let's say I send 200 and transact and confirm. So let me switch back now. Okay. I didn't switch back. So, okay. Yeah. Okay. I didn't switch. Let me do it again. Okay, I need to remix to, okay. And now I have 800 token on the Alice account because I transferred 200. So that's all. I think it's, uh, if you want to try uh, try this, this is already available in uh, our DevNet. We just uh, announced our alpha version of FHEVM. Uh, this is available on uh, on Zama, Zama FHEVM. You have a, you can click quickly the, the link. It's, uh, you have all documentation there. On FHEVM, you have all documentation and you can al already play uh, with FHEVM and uh, try to to build smart contract with uh, encryption, encryption uh, including. And uh, that's all. From DAGHAS, we have Alan Shaw. 
everyone. <laughs> uh, nice to nice to be with you again. Um, I'm here to talk to you a little bit about this new thing that's coming to uh, web free dot storage, and that new thing is called uh, content claims. And content claims are kind of like find assertions that um, about a piece of content, uh, and so they can say different things. So let me let me uh, share my screen because that would probably help <laughs> before I just chat 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 there we go uh content claims um so there's various different types of claims you can make so you can kind of think of cl uh, content claims like um uh so in the dht you publish like provider records which which say that um this cid is provided by this particular peer on the network well content claims are kind of like that um but they're you cans they're signed by people but they say they can say different things like they can say that this particular content can be found at this uh location in this car um they say they can say things like this particular piece of content can be found in this uh in this car uh in these particular car shards which is a partition claim um and they could say something like um this particular uh, car file includes these uh this these set of blocks and the uh the includes uh cid here would be like a, a cid to a car v2 index for example so um the new things that are coming to our new um apis that we're launching um hopefully uh near the end of this year uh which will be fully fully ucanified but we do uh, we've kind of retrofitted them to the existing API. So you don't have to do anything, um, but whenever you upload anything to web3.storage right now behind the scenes, um, what will happen is um, we will actually generate some content claims for your content. Um, and so what I'm going to do today is I'm going to upload a piece of content uh, and we're going to just explore uh, the content claims that got generated for it. Uh, so I'm going to use my account, which I have loads of stuff in uh you can barely lift it lift it all out so i'm going to try um but what i'm going to do first is i'm going to take a little photo to prove that this is real and live um so here's the photo of me yeah, there we go i'm going to upload i'm going to upload this and i'll put it on my desktop first i'm going to call it like my shot plan there we go uh, let's get rid of that. Uh, and then what you can do is you can just uh, like drag and drop your files and they uh, they get uploaded with a, we, we have we have a small bug here, which is uh, off by uh, like a, a, little, a little bit. I don't know, it seems to upload and sometimes it doesn't, but hopefully it's uploading. Okay, there we go, that was better. Okay, so uh, here's my uh, mugshot here, and I've got the CID um, of my of my photo. I should just be able to go to w3s.link. Uh, oh, it would help if I could spell, not history. What are we doing here? Ah, w3s.link slash um, and that should hopefully be my my face. Lucky you. Or unlucky, as the case may be. Anyway, no new things so far. This is just what you can do with um, with uh, with fruit storage right now. But behind the scenes, what's happened is with a load of content claims have been um, have been created. And if you go to um, what is the URL? GraphQL.claims.dag.house right now because it's not officially launched. Um, we get like this GraphQL um, interface, which is really nice. Um, and what you can do here is you can just explore content claims that have been generated for a particular piece of content. So if I grab, if I just put that CID in, um, it's helpful if I have the content, but if also if I include the type name uh, and run that query, then in theory I should be able to get back. Uh, a list of the content claims that have been created for that particular CID. So we can see here, we've got a petition claim and something called a relation claim. Um, and uh, so um, a partition claim is basically saying that this piece of content is found in um, in these car CIDs. Like it's been, it's been put in a car file and sent to us. Uh, and sometimes um, when the content's really big, um, the the DAG will be split into multiple car files. So a partition claim can just basically say this DAG can be found in these this set of car files. And so I can do a uh, dot 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 on um, partition claim. Um, I can look. I can actually list out the parts here, uh, and you can see here we've got 
in this particular CID, there was one part, it's one car file. Uh, and then if I go to uh, cid.ipfs.io and paste it in, you can see that that CID is actually a car file, a content addressed archive. Um, so this relates, this CID addresses a car file directly. It's a, the CID, the hash of a car file. That's pretty cool, <laughs> <It's> right? <laughs> um, uh, but then we can go further and, um, oh, what you should be aware of is what's really nice is that you can actually look at the demo here and um, have a look at um, claims and you can like drill in and see like all of the information here is really nice. Uh, anyway, back to, back to what I was saying. Um, so you can go, you can just, you can keep going. So I can say, well, I've got this um, car CID. What are the claims that were made about this car CID? So if I put claims in here, then I can see if there are any claims that were made by um, uh, for this particular um, car CID. So let's run that. And then we get back the same thing, but look, we've got like an extra extra piece here, which says that this car, uh, th there's, a, um, there's an inclusion claim here. Um, and an inclusion claim basically says that um, there is uh, another CID um, has some information about what is included in this piece of content. And uh, with inclusion claims, what you can um, what you can do is you can do on on in bear with me, I'm not super good at typing. <laughs> uh, and inclusion claims um, include so you can ask for uh, the the CID. Um, the CID of a thing that will describe what this CID includes. Uh, and in this case, this will be a CID to a car v2 index. It's a car v2 multi hash index sorted index. Um, so an inclusion claim is basically saying this car, uh, for this car, this uh, index has information about what, what blocks are in it and at what byte offsets you can find them. That's pretty cool. Uh, so yeah, and, and then we can keep we can keep going, going even deeper. Uh, so claims for claims for this one. Um, let's do let's have a look at type name. Uh, if we do claims for the this one, we've got another partition claim. Ah, so partition claims again, saying that this particular CID is found in a car in a um, in a, in a car part or. Part. So let's have a look at the part. Um, I swear this is like as deep as we're going to go. Uh, the content. Uh, but you can see how this is. Oh, uh, I need to do dot on partition claim. There we go. Uh, sorry, it's got to zoom right in my way, as you can imagine. Uh, there we go. So I think that's that's good now. So yeah, and and that is. A again a car CID. So in theory, what what this is saying is that um this car v2 index can be found in this car CID. And I, I can actually go to the gateway like w3s.link um ipfs and put in this car CID um and it will download it uh, and put it in like here. I'll just put it on my desktop for now. Um, um and um it, that car should have a car v2 index in it. Luckily, we can prove it. So let's do that. Um, ah, zoom, get out of the way. I need a terminal. There we go. Here we go. I've got this. Um, hang on. Make it bigger. Make it bigger. Uh, so I'm, I'm on my desktop. What time? Do I have time? I've got time. Okay. <laughs> Don't panic. It's okay. Um, on, on the desktop, we've got. I've got this handy um, kind of IPLD Explorer thing. Um, oh, oh. Mm. Uh, yeah, that's cool. <laughs> I've got it. It's fine. Um, uh, and what I can do is I can do IPLD. Uh, sorry, I can do a import. And then what's that car? What's that? Um, the name of that. So if I import, uh, there we go. Oh, no. Oh. <laughs> right. OK, so cool. There we go. And so if I inspect this, then I can see that this is actually an, uh, a multi hash index sorted car. Um, and it's telling me that these two, um, these two multi hashes, these are like base 58 BTC encoded multi hashes. Uh, one of them is, this is probably the directory that cause it, was, it was in a directory and then that's probably the file. Um, well, actually it doesn't matter because these are actually byte offsets. These aren't file sizes, are they? Ah, okay, anyway. 
one of them is the directory, one of them is the actual file, um, but these are the byte offsets within the car that you can find these blocks. And so we can actually prove that that is true um, for my um, my mugshot, wherever that went. There it is, oh God, okay. Um, uh, so that's that's the ID. Um, I need to grab. I need to somehow get a multi hash uh, out of that CID. I can use so IPFS tool has a cool CID tool um, which uh, allows you to um, yeah. it allows you to uh, reformat CIDs. Uh, it's really hard to speak and type. Do you ever try that? It's really hard. Um, uh, the, is it bit dash B or I don't know. Um, 58 BTC. So I, I've got like, so what, what we're saying is like, uh, I prefer CID format me a CID and the present M means give me a multi hash uh, dash B gives me uh, like tells it to encode it in base 58 BTC. And this is the CID of my uh, mugshot there, which is just, you can see behind, you can see the see throughs. Um, so then that, that should come out as that. And then, um, oh, uh, can I move that to a new window? No, I can't. Okay. Anyway, there you go. So look, for, for, Poo six, e is uh poo six e. So this thing, this um this particular multi hash, um uh, multi hash index sorted index is indeed describing the blocks that are in my car. And because I can, because I downloaded this multi hash sorted index from our gateway, um via a car file, I can also download the car file. Uh, that my co my actual content is in. We had we had we have like the very first um, claim we explored is partition claim, and it said that it's in this content. So if I download this uh, car file, it will have my content in it. Um, which I could maybe do. I've got two minutes left. Oh, okay. This is previously unexplored territory, but I should be able to download this and then do. Um, okay, so CD. Uh, uh, where did that go? Um, is over here is that one? I put it there. Uh, desk desktop, and then um, what are you called? That's that one. Uh, whoa! Don't shoot. It's actually the app store. I just want. I should just use the command line. I could bring a name on Uh, so that was like five VA, right? Um, IPFS car tool. Um list great okay the, uh, okay that's not quite what i want um blocks okay there we go uh blocks there we go the blocks um not quite sure what i was going for there anyway um so this car has has blocks for my file in it but essentially what what it means is that um you can use content claims to um to given a like root cid of some content um, what you can do is client side, go and use content claims, figure out like what car it's in, what blocks are in that car and what byte offsets they're at. Um, and then just go and get the blocks that you need. You don't have to download the whole, and what's cool about the, um, the, the gateway where you're, where you can download car files is that, um, you can actually issue HTTP range requests, uh, to it. So once you've got the car V2 multi-hash index, you can actually say, well, I want these blocks and they're at these particular ranges in, in the car, in my target car. So go and get me those blocks. And then you can do like batching to just extract the bits you need. Um, and you can all do that client side. And what's happening in our gateway when we are, um, because we receive cars from users and we store cars uh, at rest in like buckets, um, it, the, the server doesn't have to do any work. Like we make range requests to cars. And, uh, and that's about it. And last but not least, we have J. Chris with Fireproof Storage. Hey y'all, so um, I pre-recorded this because I wasn't sure if I was gonna make it in time to start and it's also kind of orchestrated, uh, but I'm super excited to show it off. It uses a lot of the tech that you're already familiar with, um, like Alan's pale clock and the W3 clock from Web3 storage and you know things like the car V2 indexes are optimizations I haven't done yet, but like when I go look to see what's on my list of ways to make um, uh, fireproof fast. A lot of it is stuff that Web3 Storage has already done, you know? 
Okay, so they wanted me to put in my pseudo password and restart my computer before you get the audio. Um, I guess I didn't like run that part of the thing. Uh, so I don't know. How about um, we just do it? We just do it the fun way. Um, I'm gonna narrate while you watch the video. So um, there you go. Uh, this is the um, the new release that I've been working on. I think it's ready for y'all to write apps. So if you're building apps on something uh, like a Filecoin or an IPFS, definitely check it out. It makes it so like you just think you're writing a React app, but everything's IPLD, um, you know, as you go in. And this is gonna be a demo of like one demo app I wrote to show off the experience. Um, so it's a public media gallery. You could do private media in Fireproof because everything's encrypted by default, but I want to do public so I could show off like gateway... Um, you know, uh, URLs and all that. Um, and also the login experience. So here you just log in with an email address and then you validate using web three storage user experience. So I think this is good enough for your end users. If you're not trying to brand it, right. It's not going to confuse them. If you tell them what to expect, they just click one link and now they're into the app. Um, so what happens next in the demo is that I show you an already logged in version, just, um, so you don't have to wait for all the, all the sync, but in the background, it's logged in and it's like bringing the data down to the database. Um, oh, now we're going to take a little break. That's not demo anymore. This is how it works. So we're looking at the architecture. Uh, inside of Fireproof, there's the CRDT that's the pale clock that that Alan uh, created that I've helped a little bit with. Um, and the updates come into that. And the cool thing about a CRDT is the updates are item potent. It doesn't matter what order they show up at because they carry the event information for the parent that they overwrite in them. And allows your stuff to get merged. Um, allows you to do, you know, concurrent edits with multiple users, uh, and it kind of makes it so I don't have to think about uh, a lot of database problems. I can just throw data into my data structure. Um, so data comes into the CRDT, and then it gets merged. Uh, it gets run um, through this indexer function that you define, where you can be like, "Hey, index all my documents by ID or by user ID or by title or date created or whatever." Um, and what's special about the way we store them, and this is Michael Rogers Prawley trees that um, a, a bunch of folks helped with, uh, is that no matter what order you do this indexing work, you get the same CID for your index at the end. So it makes the replication super efficient and you can do like Merkle diffs on your data and, and, and all that. Um, so, all right, so that's like how um, the logical storage works. Uh, and then those green blocks coming off the bottom are, of course, every time you do an operation on one of these, you're going to create blocks. It's just a stream of blocks coming out for each operation. So we were talking about car files. What I do is I wrap a transaction's worth of blocks up as a car file, and I put a custom car header on it, which we're going to zoom in on in a second. Um, but as a database, right, each transaction is a car file. And then you can take a bunch of transactions, like the whole history of the database and wrap it up into one car file via compaction for fast, like web loads. So you can load your whole client experience from a single URL. Um, so yeah, all my stuff's encrypted by default, which is using a symmetric key. And that's what that blue wrapper indicates. Um, so it just means that if you wanted IPFS infrastructure to serve it out, you would want, you'd need to share the key with the backend. Um, but as it is, it's end-to-end -end encrypted. So just the clients can read it. Inside that IPLD header on my car files is just a list of the rest of the car files you need to get the full database with the oldest one being either the first car file or the result of a compaction. Um, and so we're zooming in on that list here. And essentially the way we maintain consistency is there's also an in-browser write-ahead log that says like these car files are not committed to the cloud yet and these are. Um, and it writes them through Web3 storage to IPFS and then as soon as a batch of those car files is available and written, then it updates this metadata header in um, W3 clock. So uh, W3 clock as a wrapper around the whole thing, um, this gets unencrypted blocks that point to encrypted car files. And it really just cares about the order of operations on those encrypted car files. It's up to the client databases to decrypt and merge once they get them. Um, so W3 clock kind of makes it so you only have to download the relevant car files. And so you don't have a uh, last right wins problem. Um, so yeah, uh, that's like, oh, again, yeah. And then on read, right. You just pull like maybe two or three car files that are all like in parallel heads and merge them in the CRDT. 
and get that database experience. So it's super robust to um, bringing in data from you know multiple locations and merging it or from the browser in the cloud. Uh, and the last thing you get to see, oh, back in the demo here is how the demo actually works. And this is at publicmedia.fireproofs.storage if you want to play with it. But um, I'm customizing a demo. What I'm showing off here is since it's already logged in via Web3 storage, you can do IPFS stuff real easy. So everything happening on the screen right now is encrypted database stuff um, where I set my like user preferences. This is all JSON data that's behind the encryption key. But when I do publish, it just does a regular upload um, to IPFS. And now this is an archive URL that you can share with your friends to show off your customized photo gallery. In the demo here, I'm just switching over to the other browser to show that it's also logged in and those same you know galleries are available there and the last little bit is just some interaction stuff to show how um you know building in fireproof lets you do react style user interactions so i just drop some files on um, the uploads are almost instantaneous and then i can create a new album for crowds and take my like ai generated uh that's the nine inch nails crowd it's like a beyonce crowd um you know so i just made crowds for for different artists. Um, I think, uh, that one's talking heads. I forget who everybody is, but, but right. Um, and, uh, yeah, I just think it's fun to be able to have that mix of encrypted and public data and like kind of use your browser as a CMS that can publish back to the web. Um, but that's just one use case, right? Like the other use cases that people are going to build this for, um, in this crowd, let's say you were putting a bunch of data into Filecoin and it had some structure, like you're uploading an archive, I don't know, a bunch of media files or something, easily build a browsable interface for it where then the diffs go into IPFS and, and eventually Filecoin via Web3 storage. What we're seeing here is that um, the library itself has an open dashboard function that pops open this URL with an import. So um, you can inspect your application's data and see like, oh, here was an upload with 41 files or, or whatever. Um, this allows you to get inside of your data uh, and play with it with all your database conveniences. So I'm hoping that people here want to write apps that live on the IPFS stack. Uh, there's no other cloud in here besides Web3 storage stuff. And uh, here's just another app that uses LLMs to build um, you know, simulated interviews with potential customers. Um, and the last thing I'm going to show is a starter kit uh, that's really meant to be kind of like nothing but the crud wrapper. So if you wanted to build a, you know, um, item with a detail view and the lists and the drill down kind of app, like that's all done. And now you just get to decide what your app is about. Uh, so there's a starter kit for uh, you to, to try if you want. Um, so yeah, thanks a ton for um, watching the video. And hopefully that made some sense and, and get you all excited about writing apps. Thank you so much, Jay Chris. That was great. Uh, so well, that concludes our Oct well, September uh, Mother of All Demo Days. A special thank you goes out to all of our presenters from Zenrock, Mimic, Zama, Fireproof, and Daghouse who um, presented today. Um, our next demo day will be October 19th. Um, so watch out for that invite <clears throat> if anybody's interested in presenting. Um, We'll have inf more information in the coming weeks. And I'll have the recording up for those who may have missed today's meeting by the end of the day. So thank you so much, everybody. Um, if you have any questions or links to share, definitely let me know. And uh, thank you again. Have a great day, guys.